All right. Welcome to Creekside Book by Book for July 13th, 2022. And tonight we are going to be uh, walking through 1 Samuel chapters 12 through 15. And this is a um, portion of this the story where we are going to start to see uh, Samuel uh, fade away and Saul come into prominence, but also we're going to see Saul's failure in his leadership uh, as well, because he is not rightly prioritizing the things of God um, and following these instructions uh, that Samuel gives. Um, and we're going to see one of the key things in the life of Saul. And I want to make sure I say this ahead of time and so I don't forget later. Um, Saul's major problem is a fear of the people abandoning him. And so when we look at the reasons Saul does different things, like it comes down to fear of people. And for a, lead, a leader in, uh, in, in, in this role, you can't uh, be afraid of what people say or think about you. Um, and he doesn't have the confidence in the Lord that, uh, that God will actually help him to secure the victory. And so he tries to make victories happen in his own, uh, his own strength, his own timing, uh, with his own rash decisions. And all of these things will lead to conflict in the life of Saul. And so as we are jumping in, uh, chapter 12, we are getting Samuel's uh, like last public address. And um, he is presenting his ministry um, to the people as a way of, of saying like, look, I have treated you well, and I've done everything I can to live honorably before you. And the people affirm that. So let's jump in. Uh, chapter 12, verse 1. Samuel said to all Israel, I have listened to everything you said to me and have set a king over you. Now you have a king as your leader. As for me, I am old and gray, and my sons are here with you. I have been your leader from my youth until this day. Here I stand. Testify against me in the presence of the Lord and his anointed. Uh, whose ox have, have I taken? Whose donkey have I taken? Whom have I cheated? Whom have I oppressed? For whose hand have I accepted a bribe? to make me shut my eyes. If I have done any of these things, I will make it right. You have not cheated or oppressed us, they replied. You have not taken anything from anyone's hand. Samuel said to them, the Lord is witness against you and also his anointed is witness this day that you have not found anything in my hand. He is witness, they said. And so here, as, as I said, he's holding court one last time before the people. Uh, Sam, Samuel's job, uh, and his role was to provide uh, wisdom, leadership, correction, direction, um, but also uh, actually just dis handling disputed matters with people as a judge. And so he is now stepping into that place where the people can evaluate him. And that, uh, this is, I think, one of the key things as we look at good leaders in the Bible. Samuel is one of those who finishes well. He does what he's supposed to do. He obeys the Lord in all things as we read through scripture. Um, and so he's like, I haven't cheated you. I haven't taken any bribes. And everybody can say, yeah, we, we agree. You have been um, a good leader, which it makes it even more heartbreaking when we see how they were like, you know, we don't want you, Samuel, anymore. You're getting old. We don't want your sons because they're not as good as you. Uh, so give us a king like other nations. Um, and so there is that uh, a little bit of heartbreak here as Samuel is saying, like, I did the best I could. And they, they're all saying, you did, but we don't want it anymore. Um, and so uh, so that's kind of where we're at there. And then, verse six, then Samuel said to the people, it is the Lord who appointed Moses and Aaron and brought your ancestors up out of Egypt. Now then stand here because I am going to confront you with evidence before the Lord as to all the righteous acts performed by the Lord for you and your ancestors. And so he's making a call to history and an appeal to history as a witness uh, to the people of their tendency to um, fall into disobedience, but then call it to the Lord and the Lord's faithfulness. Um, and so that's why he's going all the way back to Moses. Um, 
After Jacob, verse eight, after Jacob entered Egypt and cried to the Lord for help, and the Lord sent Moses and Aaron, who brought your ancestors out of Egypt and settled them in this place. But they forgot the Lord, their God. So he sold them into the hands of Sisera, the commander of the army of Hazor, and into the hands of the Philistines and the kings of Moab, who fought against them. They cried out to the Lord and said, we have sinned, we have forsaken the Lord and served the Baals and Ashtoreths, but now deliver us from the hands of our enemies and we will serve you. Then the Lord sent Jeroboam, Barak, Jephthah, and Samuel, and he delivered you from the hands of your enemies all around you so that you lived in safety. And so he's giving a, a history, a basically a, a quick overview of the book of Judges that we would have. Um, and so kind of talking about the cycle of rebellion, repentance, crying out to the Lord and God rescuing them. That cycle happened over and over again. And Samuel then, he places himself at the end of this lit brief list here of the judges um, because he sees himself as carrying on that leadership tradition that we read about in Judges. Um, and so the Lord was faithful again and again. But when you saw Nahash, king of the Ammonites, was moving against you, you said to me, no, we want a king to rule over us, even though the Lord your God was your king. Now here is the king you have chosen, the one you asked for. See, the Lord has set a king over you. If you fear the Lord and serve and obey him and do not rebel against his commands, and if both you and the king who reigns over you follow the Lord your God, good. But if you do not obey the Lord, and if you rebel against his commands, his hand will be against you as it was against your ancestors. And so, um, again, now he's trend building the case about like how we got here. Nahash of the Ammonites was coming. They saw his power building over in the east. And so they said, we want a king who can lead us in military victory. Um, and so that's what Saul did. And we talked about that last time. Uh, now then, stand still and see this great thing the Lord is about to do before your eyes. It is not, is it not wheat harvest now? I will call on the Lord to send thunder and rain, and you will realize what an evil thing you did in the eyes of the Lord when you asked for a king. Then Samuel called on the Lord, and the same day the Lord sent thunder and rain. So all the people stood in awe of the Lord and of Samuel. The people all said to Samuel, pray to the Lord your God for your servants so that we will not die, for we have added to all our other sins the evil of asking for a king. Now, this sign that Samuel calls out for this um, uh, rain and thunder during the wheat harvest. Now, around in our region, like rain, it rains all the time. And so sometimes we might miss some things because we just like, well, yeah, rain happens. But here, uh, the wheat harvest was in May and June, uh, and rain and thunder during those times in this part of the, the world are very rare. And so um, one of the, the challenges is if it rains too hard during the season, it could destroy the crop. Um, and so uh, the Samuel is calling on the Lord to bring rain and thunder um, at a specific time. And that's, that's the real miracle is not just that it's out of season, but it's, it's out of season and it's exactly when Samuel calls for it. Um, and so they recognize like, all right, Samuel, you're not messing around. The Lord is uh, testifying through this sign that Samuel is telling the truth. And so we, we need to trust Samuel, trust the Lord. We need to not turn away from his call and design for our lives. Um, and so they see this as a God-ordained event, um, and they are wary. So they say, please pray for us that we won't add even more sins when we already added the sin of asking for a king. Um, and so he says, do not be afraid. Uh, Samuel replied, you have done all this evil, yet, <laughs> excuse me, you have done all this evil, Yet do not turn away from the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. Do not turn away after useless idols. They can do you no good, nor can they rescue you, because they are useless. For the sake of his great name, the Lord will not reject his people, because the Lord was pleased to make you his own. As for me, far be it from me that, that I should sin against the Lord by failing to pray for you. 
and I will teach you the way that is good and right, but be sure to fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart. Consider what great things he has done for you. Yet if you persist in doing evil, both you and your king will perish. Now, this speech uh, here is the longest public address that we have from Samuel. And it is also really the first time that we see him uh, operating in a way similar to later prophets. Um, and so he has done prophetic work uh, in, the, the, in the kingdom here, in the nation of Israel. But this is really the first time he preaches against the people, corrects them, calls them to covenant faithfulness, um, and even uh, we see signs and wonders as he calls out on the Lord, right? This is a um, major moment here for, for Samuel as, as a prophet. Um, and even as he's leaving, the people are like, please help us. Uh, and he says, I will help you. I will continue to pray for you. I will continue to teach, teach you, but I'm not going to be the, the guy in charge anymore. He's backing away um, from the leadership role over the nation, and he's going to continue to be available to teach them and direct them in spiritual matters. Um, and so he's not planning on just re removing himself from them altogether. And so the king's role then uh, is not supposed to be stepping in as a priest or a prophet. He, the king's role really is to uh, lead the people in the administration of the nation. And in particular, um, what the people are looking for is a military leader. Um, and so that's the, that's the king's role. And Saul, we saw him step into that role, and we saw him uh, leading the people as they came against uh, Nahash and rescued the people of Jabesh. Like, he's good at this. Um, and so he seems to be the man for the job. So uh, that, that doesn't last for very long <laughs> as we walk into chapter 13, we uh, will see that there is a, um, a quick descent. And one of, the, one of the challenges that we have um, is we don't have every event that happened in the life of Saul or Sam, right? We don't have all the events that happened in the life of David. Um, I, in this shelf right here and up here, I have like a bunch of presidential biographies. Um, almost all of them are over 500 pages long for just a dude who was president, right? Um, these right here are Lyndon Johnson. There's four volumes. Each of them is 800, 800 pages. I haven't read those yet. I just have them for later. Um, and, uh, but there's so much information that we have on political leaders, uh, world leaders uh, in the last uh, several hundred years um, that like we get a pretty good picture of this person and, and people are continuing to write biographies of all these people They captured their letters, all this stuff. We don't have that for these ancient leaders. And so we don't have, uh, like a really detailed record of, of, of Saul as a King, um, before, like before things went bad, like he could have been doing a lot of good stuff for a long time. Um, but we see, um, we do see just the, as I said at the onset, uh, the fear of people that will keep him from truly trusting the Lord and being uh, obedient to God's commands. Um, and even like when we talk about details about Saul's leadership, the first verse of chapter one has some challenges um, because in the Hebrew text, the numbers are not complete. Um, and, and so there's some questions about what is going on here? So verse one says, Saul was 30 years old when he became king and he reigned over Israel 42 years. Um, and so there is some information that is unclear um, in Hebrew texts um, that, that we're working on. And so the, these numbers are not completely made up. Um, they're, tr they're good estimates based on the context and how things are working. And, and they follow a similar pattern with several of the other kings. When we get into the historical books where we read about king became a king at this age and served this many years. And so there's a pattern uh, for the, the king's uh, 
brief biograph biographical statement there. But um, so when we want information about these kings, like even as we start with the king kingdom of Saul, uh, there's already a challenge with how we can with counting these numbers. And so tradition um, and even the apostle Paul, he uses um, the, the, the 42 years when he's talking about Saul leading. And so um, it's well agreed upon, um, but it is still one of those things where it's like, man, it'd be great if they had just a little bit more detail. Um, and so Saul is king when he is 30. So his son, Jonathan is um, most likely, uh, you know, if Saul got married around 15, which would not have been unusual, he had a kid, his son, uh, Jonathan would be a late teenager um, as Saul's leadership is continuing to grow. Um, and Jonathan will become a good contrast even with Saul. Jonathan will uh, trust that the Lord is working um, and be willing to act um, and trust that God will inter intercede uh, and intervene. Um, Saul is a lot more hesitant to, to act when he should act, uh, and he's more impetuous to act when he should not act. Um, and so uh, we have that contrast between Saul and uh, Jonathan. And as we read through, it's like, man, Jonathan probably would have been a great king, but it's his father who uh, disobeyed God that is going to keep him from becoming a king. Uh, so as he's becoming, stepping into his leadership, Saul chose in verse two, Saul chose 3000 men from Israel. 2000 were with him at Michmash in the hill country of Bethel and a thousand with Jonathan at Gibeah in Benjamin, the rest of the men he sent back to their homes. And so this is his like standing army, his, uh, Royal guard, uh, the best of the best are with Saul and Jonathan, um, Jonathan attacked the Philistine outpost at Geba. And the Philistines heard about it. Then Saul had the trumpet blown throughout the land and said, let the Hebrews hear. So all Israel heard the news. Saul has attacked the Philistine outpost. And now Israel has become obnoxious to the Philistines. And the people were summoned to join Saul at Gilgal. Um, the Philistines assembled to fight Israel with 3,000 chariots, 6,000 charioteers and soldiers. And uh, as numerous as the sand on the seashore, they went up and camped at Michmash, east of Beth Avon. When the Israelites saw that their situation was critical and their army was hard pressed, they hid in caves and thickets among the rocks and in pits and cisterns. Some Hebrews even crossed to the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. And so they have a 3,000 man army. Um, and Jonathan provokes a conflict with the Philistines. He, it just says, Jonathan attacked this outpost. We don't know what led to that decision to attack. He just did it. Um, and this led then Saul to calling out the rest of the fighting force. Instead of just 3,000, he's calling the rest of the fighting force, the people who are available, the town militias and those kinds of groups to come and join to fight against the Philistines. Um, and so as they... They're gathering their forces. The Philistines are gathering their forces. What the text is trying to communicate to us is the Philistines are the military strength here. They have chariots um, and soldiers as numerous as the sand on the seashore. There is no reason that the people of Israel should uh, really expect to win against this force. And we see that, that even some people cross the Jordan River um, to the land of Gad and Gilead. And so that's a kind of a shorthand way of talking about um, the Israel, Israelites on the, west, uh, the east side of the Jordan River, the lands of Gad and Gilead. It's Reuben, um, Gad, the tribes over there are Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh, half of Manasseh. And so um, this is just a shorthand way of saying that. So while they are, there's people crossing over, there's people hiding, uh, they're experiencing like a lot of pressure from the Philistines. It's not going great. Um, and even getting from Gilgal, which is by the Jordan River to Michmash, um, you know, this is not a, uh, a quick trip. It's about 20 miles. And so moving these people all over to Michmash would have taken some time. Um, and some commentaries are even pointing out that maybe Sam, uh, Saul is staying behind a little bit. 
um, and sending people away. So he's not going into the battle the way he used to. Um, and so, yeah, and that's picked up here. Saul remained at Gilgal. Um, and the troops that were with him were quaking with fear. He waited seven days, the time set by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal and Saul's men began to scatter. So he said, bring me the burnt offerings and the fellowship offerings. And Saul offered up the burnt offerings. Just as he finished making the offerings, Samuel arrived and Saul went out to greet him. What have you done? Asked Samuel. Saul replied, when I saw the men were scattering and that you did not come at the set time and that the Philistines were assembling at Michmash, I thought now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal and I have not sought the Lord's favor. So I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering. You have done a foolish thing, Samuel said. You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. Then Samuel left Gilgal and went up to Gibeah in Benjamin. And Saul counted the men who were with him. They numbered about 6,000. So Saul is, his army is afraid. They start to scatter and he decides like, well, I'm not going to wait for Samuel anymore. I'm just going to make this sacrifice, which Saul as a king uh, is not supposed to make any sacrifices. Um, that's the role of the priests. And Samuel is, grew up as a priest. He is the spiritual leader of the nation still. Um, and so he, for some reason, there is this set time. We're not given any reason why um, that Samuel gave a set time, but he took longer than anticipated. Now, remember, Samuel is an old man. He probably doesn't move as fast as he used to. Um, but the, the problem is that Saul saw the people leaving and he's like, I need an army. They're all leaving. I'm not going to wait for God's chosen person to do the offering. I'm just going to do it myself. And so he, uh, this act of rebellion removes him from the uh, opportunity to have a uh, eternal dynasty of kings for the people of Israel. Um, and so the Lord, uh, Samuel says like, you know, God would have done this for you, but now he's pursuing somebody, uh, a man after his own heart. And that phrase um, has some questions around it because it's not necessarily that David is a more righteous person just as a baseline. It's more about a man after God's own heart is God's heart is choosing this person. This person is patterned in the way that like will honor God more than uh, Saul is doing. So it's not that David is better. Uh, it's more that just God sees him and chooses him, and he knows that he will do better later. But we'll see. David is far from perfect. He is far from perfect. Um, and so he's going to have his own uh, challenges as well. Um, and so um, as they go into the battle, the army grows from 3,000 standing army to 6,000, which is still not enough. That's not enough. The, the Philistines have a huge force. And as we continue on uh, in verse 16, um, we see that they're even oppressing the people of Israel even more. Verse 16, Saul and his son Jonathan and the men with them were staying in Gibeah in Benjamin while the Philistines camped at Michmash. Raiding parties went out from the Philistine camp in three detachments. One turned towards Ophrah in the vicinity of Shual, another towards Beth Horon, and the third toward the borderland overlooking the valley of Zeboim, facing the wilderness. Not a blacksmith could be found in the whole land of Israel because the Philistines had said, otherwise the Hebrews will make swords or spears. So all Israel went down to the Philistines to have their plow points, mattocks, axes, and sickles sharpened. The price was two thirds of a shekel for sharpening plow points and mattocks and a third of a shekel for sharpening forks and axes and for repointing goats. So on the day of the battle, not a soldier with Saul and Jonathan had a sword or spear in his hand. Only Saul and his son Jonathan had them. So the Philistines have 
rounded up any potential blacksmiths that may be in uh, in the land of Israel um, because they would be a threat to uh, to the Philistines if they, they could make their own weapons and sharpen their own spears and stuff. Um, and so they are they have a technological advantage, they have a commerce advantage, um, and they are able to rip off the people um, as they are saying, like, you got to come to us to uh, to sharpen your tools. And so they they needed to sharpen their tools to do the work of of agriculture. And so uh, the people of Israel are in a really bad way uh, here. And um, this is all happening as a uh, as, as there's a shift between the Bronze Age and the Iron Age. And so like weaponry and all of these things, um, the advantage is all shifting to the Philistines in the earthly realm. There is no reason that the people of Israel should expect to have any victory over the Philistines. Um, they have everything going in their direction. But that doesn't limit the Lord. And verse 14 is one of the coolest chapters in uh, this book. Um, and so let's jump into it. Now a detachment of Philistines had gone out to the pass at Michmash. One day, Jonathan, son of Saul, said to his young armor bearer, come, let's go over to the Philistine outpost on the other side. But he did not tell his father. Saul was staying on the outskirts of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree in Migron. With him were about 600 men among whom was Ahijah, who was wearing an ephod. He was the son of Ichabod's brother, Ahitub, son of Phinehas, the son of Eli, the Lord's priest in Shiloh. No one was aware that Jonathan had left. So, um, yeah, so Jonathan and his young armor bearer. This isn't just like an intern. Uh, this is like his most trusted person uh, who would fight alongside him, help him get ready for battle, all of those things. This is a um, a key p friend for Jonathan. Um, and he's just like, Hey, let's just go over there and see, let's just see what happens. Um, and so, uh, they leave and Saul is staying away, um, in Gibeah and with him is the priest. Now, and all of these, um, names, uh, we should note he was the son, uh, Ahijah, the son of Ichabod's brother, Ahitub, son of Phineas, the son of Eli. So remember, <clears throat> Phineas and his brother were corrupt and the Lord killed them. Uh, and so um, a high tube, uh, his um, brother, Ichabod's brother, a high tube son of Phineas. Uh, Ichabod, and remember his name is, uh, meaning it's like the glory has departed from Israel uh, as as. Eli died and uh, Ichabod's um, father died. Uh, so all these things are like, this is not a long lasting priestly line. It's something that we need to keep in mind. Ahijah is not going to endure. Um, and so that's who's with Saul right now. Uh, verse four, on each side of the pass that Jonathan intended across to reach the Philistines outpost was a cliff. One was called Bozes and the other Senna. One cliff stood to the north toward Michmash, the other toward the south towards Geba. Jonathan said to his young armor bearer, come, let's go over to the outpost of those uncircumcised men. Perhaps the Lord will act in our behalf. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. Do all that you have in, in mind, his armor bearer said. Go ahead, I am with you, heart and soul. And so Jonathan's uh, posture in this passage is, let's go. Perhaps the Lord will rescue us. Perhaps the Lord will intervene for us. There is nothing that can limit God. And uh, his armor bearer is like, I'm with you. Let's do this. Because Jonathan also recognizes like there's nothing to lose. Like we are basically almost defeated anyway. There's two weapons in the whole army. And Jonathan has one of them. So somebody's got to put these weapons to work uh, if they want to have a victory. And Jonathan is willing to, to go ahead and do what he thinks uh, the Lord, might, where the Lord might intervene. So Jonathan said, come on then, we will cross over toward them and let them see us. So he's not even trying to hide. Uh, if they say to us, wait there until we come to you, we will stay there and not go up to them. But if they say, come up to us, we will climb up because they, that will be our sign that the Lord has given them into our hands. So both of them showed themselves to the Philistine outpost. Look, said the Philistines, 
The Hebrews are crawling out of the holes they were hiding in. The men of the outpost shouted to Jonathan and his armor bearer, come up to us and we'll teach you a lesson. So Jonathan said to his armor bearer, climb up after me. The Lord has given them into the hand of Israel. Jonathan climbed up using his hands and feet with his armor bearer right behind him. The Philistines fell before Jonathan and his armor bearer followed and killed behind him. In the first attack, Jonathan and his armor bearer killed some 20 men in an area of about half an acre. And so Jonathan and his armor bearer, they're just like rock climbing up this cliff. And the Philistines are like, look at these fools. And they, they are so sure that these are just desperate, foolish uh, people that they like, come on up here. Yeah, we got nothing to worry about you. Come up here. Let's teach you a lesson. And so they are overconfident that they can defeat uh, these two people. And Jonathan sees their overconfidence and he's like, wow, that's exactly what God wants us to, uh, it's the sign that God is with us and he will help us defeat them. And so they climb up and like they have enough energy after climbing up these cliffs uh, to also then kill 20 men um, in about a half an acre, which is amazing. Now, all of this is so unusual. Like this is not something I, that we would anticipate a prince to do uh, today. But Jonathan is trusting that perhaps the Lord will save. Um, and so they do, uh, they, they fight this battle, they win. Uh, verse 15, then panic struck the whole army, those in the camp and field and those in the outposts and raiding parties and the ground shook. It was a panic sent by God. Now, so the pe- Saul was probably focused on the weapons. There's only two weapons, but the Lord is not limited to weapons. The Lord is able to create this great panic maybe an earthquake. The ground shook, could be shaking from the commotion of the people scattering, or it could also just be a, an earthquake that the Lord shook the ground and created even more panic. Saul's lookouts at Gibeah and Benjamin saw the army melting away in all directions. Then Saul said to the men who were with them, muster the forces and see who has, has left us. When they did, it was Jonathan and his armor bearer who were not there. Saul said to Ahisha, bring the ark of God. At that time, it was in It was with the Israelites. While Saul was talking to the priest, the tumult in the Philistine camp increased more and more. So Saul said to the priest, withdraw your hand. Now that is uh, an important thing. Ahijah is trying to prepare the people, uh, the army, bless the army, do priestly things, and it's taking too long. And so uh, again, Saul like interrupts the, the way that things are supposed to go. And he tells the priest to withdraw his hand, stop what you're doing. Then Saul and all his men assembled and went to the battle. They found the Philistine in, the total, in total confusion, striking each other with their swords. Those Hebrews who had previously been with the Philistines and had gone up with them to their camp went over to the Israelites who were with Saul and Jonathan. When all the Israelites who had hidden in the hill country of Ephraim heard that the Philistines were on the run, they joined in the battle in hot pursuit. So on that day, the Lord saved Israel and the battle moved on beyond Beth Avon. So a victory because Jonathan and his armor bearer were willing to trust the perhaps. Perhaps God would intervene and he would fight for them. In the earlier uh, passages, when Saul led the army, the spirit of the Lord came upon him and empowered him. We don't see that here with Jonathan. We don't see him. Uh, having that spirit empowerment, um, but he is a man of faith nonetheless. And so he is willing to uh, trust the Lord with the battle and, and God does this. And um, yeah. And so they are going up to, um, so the people start fighting and, and they see even the Philistines are fighting amongst themselves And so like, there's two weapons again, two weapons in the army of Israel before this battle. And now the Philistines are killing one another. And so that this is now an opportunity for the Israelites to harvest weapons from their enemies. And, uh, and so all of this, God is providing for them. He's taking care of them. Um, and, uh, and they're routing the people, the, the, the enemies It's all going so well. Um, verse 24 though. Uh, now the Israelites were in distress that day because Saul had bound the people under an oath. 
saying, curse be anyone who eats food before evening comes, before I have avenged myself on my enemies. So none of the troops tasted food. So as they went into the battle at some point, Saul said, no eating, no eating till the battle is done until I am avenged. Uh, and so they are in distress. They're worn out. They're tired because they're trying to follow after Saul's command and the oath that he has placed them under, uh, which is not an oath that God called them to do. It is an impetuous oath and it will be a problem. The entire army entered the woods and there was honey on the ground. When they went into the woods, they saw the honey oozing out. Yet no one put his hand to his mouth because they feared the oath. But Jonathan had not heard that his father had bound the people with the oath. So he reached out the end of the staff that was in his hand and dipped it into the honeycomb. He raised his hand to his mouth and his eyes brightened. So Jonathan was hangry. He had a snack and he felt better. Uh, and so... Then one of the soldiers told him, your father bound the army under a strict oath, saying, curse be anyone who eats food today. That is why the men are faint. And Jonathan said, my father has made trouble for the country. See how my eyes brightened when I tasted a little of his honey, of this honey? How much better would it have been if the men had eaten today some of the plunder they took from the Philistines? Would not the slaughter of the Philistines have been even greater? That day, the Israelites had struck down the Philistines from Michmash to uh, Aijalon, they were exhausted. They pounced on the plunder and taking sheep, cattle, and calves, they butchered them on the ground and ate them together with the blood. Then someone said to Saul, look, the men are sinning against the Lord by eating meat that has blood in it. Now, this, um, this is a ritual impurity now at this point, because the, the people of Israel were supposed to properly butcher meat and, and make sure that all of the blood was drained out um, before they were even to cook it. Um, that doesn't mean that they couldn't eat a, like, a medium rare steak. That's different. Um, uh, but they were, not a, they were not following proper uh, butchering protocol. Uh, and so they were eating meat that was um, still the blood in it, still maybe even raw, uh, which is all bad. And so, um, so, uh, Saul says, you have broken faith. He said, roll large stone over here at once. Then he said, go out among the men and tell them each of you, bring me your cattle and sheep and slaughter them here and eat them. Do not sin against the Lord by eating meat with blood still in it. So here, Saul is trying to do the right thing, trying to get everybody to do the proper rituals here. So everyone brought his ox that night and slaughtered it there. Then Saul built an altar to the Lord. It was the first time he had done this. Saul said, let us go down and pursue the Philistines by night and plunder them till dawn. And let us not leave one of them let alive. Do whatever, you, whatever seems best to you, they replied. But the priest said, let us inquire of God here. Look at this, the priest, Ahijah, saying, let us inquire of the Lord. But maybe we should rest. Maybe we should stop. I don't know. The priest is just trying to figure out what does God want us to do instead of Saul just pressing to get vengeance for himself until I am avenged against my enemies. That's what Saul said earlier. So Saul asked God, shall I go down and pursue the Philistines? Will you give them into Israel's hands? But God did not answer him that day. And so um, Saul was probably inquiring of the Lord by asking these yes, no questions with the umim and the thurum, which are the two stones that the high priest would have as part, in, like in a pouch by, behind the ephod. They would reach in, uh, and so the person would ask, do you, Lord, will you, do you want me to go pursue the Philistines? They would reach in, and they would pull one out, and if it was a yes or a no, um, it would be uh, confirming for the person inquiring of the Lord what they should do. So it's a, it's a binary. It's yes, no. As, and here, though, God did not answer him that day. So I don't know how a yes, no doesn't give an answer, as the priest is the one who's reaching in and pulling out a stone. Um, and so there is a, there's a question here. Like, what is, what's happening where it is unclear what they should do? Saul, therefore, said, come here, all you who are leaders in the army, and let us find out what sin has been committed today. As surely as the Lord who rescues Israel lives, even if the guilt lies with my son, Jonathan, he must die. 
but not one of them said a word. And so uh, Saul then said to the Israelites, you all stand over there. I and Jonathan and my son will stand over here. And so he's trying to create, Saul is creating a us them, like we're cool. You, you guys have a problem situation. Uh, and so now he's trying to discern. Uh, and uh, they all say, do what seems best with you. Then Saul prayed to the Lord, the God of Israel. Why have you not answered your servant today? If the fault is in me or my son, Jonathan, respond with Urim. But if the men of Israel are at fault, respond with Thummim. Jonathan and Saul were taken by Lot and the men were cleared. So the priest reached into the pouch, pulled out the Urim. It is you, Saul and Jonathan, who have committed a sin. Saul, um, Saul said, cast the lot between me and Jonathan, my son. And Jonathan was taken. Then Saul said to Jonathan, tell me what you have done. So Jonathan told him, I tasted a little honey with the end of my staff, and now I must die. Saul said, may God deal with me, be it ever so severely, if you do not die, Jonathan. But the men said to Saul, should Jonathan die? He who has brought about this great deliverance in Israel? Never. As surely as the Lord lives, not a hair on his head will fall to the ground. For he did this day with God's help. For, uh, for he did this today with God's help. So the men rescued Jonathan and he was not put to death. Then Saul stopped pursuing the Philistines and they withdrew to their own land. After Saul had ass assumed rule over Israel, he fought against their enemies on every side. Moab, the Ammonites, Edom, the kings of Zobah, the Philistines, were, wherever he turned, he inflicted punishment on them. He fought valiantly and defeated the Amalekites, delivering Israel from the hands of those who plundered them. Saul's sons were Jonathan, Ishvi, and Malki, and Shua, this, the name of his older daughter. His older daughter was Marab, and that of his younger was M Michael. His wife's name was Ahanoam daughter of Ahimaaz, the name of the commander of Saul's army was Abner, son of Ner, the, and Ner was Saul's uncle, Saul's father, Kish, and Abner came, uh, father, Abner's father, Ner, were sons of Abiel. All the days of Saul, there was bitter war with the Philistines, and when Saul was a mighty, and whenever Saul saw a mighty or brave man, he took him into his service. So here, uh, finishing out chapter 14, um, the people looked to, uh, as Jonathan is chosen, they inter intercede and intervene for Jonathan. They say, Jonathan won this victory for us, not Saul. And so this is a problem uh, that will haunt Saul for the rest of his life, really, is other people getting credit for military victories. And it starts not with David, it starts with Jonathan. And the people are not really trusting Saul in his oath here. They're saying, no, your oath is garbage. Jonathan needs to live. And so they rescue him. Um, and, you know, but they, Saul continues to fight. He continues to put, pers pursue the Philistines and defeat them. And then the other, the Edomites, Ammonites, all these different nations. Saul is winning. He's a strong military leader. Like we have this good picture of him. Um, and, and then we get this biography of his family um, and essentially all his life, the conflict between the Philistines. And then whenever saw Saul, a mighty or brave man, he took him into his service. Now this is going to be important because we'll, when we meet David, David is drafted into Saul's service first as a musician and a worship leader, second as a warrior. And it seems like as he, is, as he meets David um, at, when in the conflict with Goliath, he doesn't remember David. Um, but this pattern of seeing somebody who is brave or valiant, Saul is taking them into his service. And that's one of the things that Samuel warned the people. The king will take your sons. And so um, he's doing that. Chapter 15, and we'll, we'll stop with 15. Um, and I'm going to go uh, uh, quickly through 15, I hope. Um, so let's jump in here. Samuel said to Saul, I am the Lord, one the Lord sent to anoint you king over the people of Israel. So listen now to the message from the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I will punish the Amalekites for what they did to Israel when they waylaid them as they came up from Egypt. 
Now go attack the Amalekites and totally destroy all, uh, all that belong to them. Do not spare them. Put to death men and women, children and infants, cattle and sheep, camels and donkeys. So this is a uh, complete uh, ban uh, is what we would read this as. All, everything that is Amalekite needs to be completely devoted to destruction. That's what's going on here. So Saul summoned the men and mustered them at Talaim, 200,000 foot soldiers and 10,000 from Judah, which is a, a lot of people. Earlier, the army was uh, a couple thousand, a few thousand. Now here we have uh, 200,000 uh, soldiers. Saul went to the city of Amalek and set an ambush in the ravine. Then he said to the Kenites, go away, leave the Amalekites so that I do not destroy you along with them, for you show kindness to all the Israelites when they came out of Egypt. So the Kenites moved away from the Amalekites. Then Saul attacked the Amalekites all the way from Havilah to Ashur near the eastern border of Egypt. He took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive, and all the people he totally destroyed with a sword. But Saul and the army spared Agag and the best of the sheep and cattle, the fat calves and lambs, everything that was good, these they were unwilling to destroy completely, but everything that was despised and weak, they totally destroyed. Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel. I regret that I have made Saul king because he has turned away from me and has not carried out my instructions. Samuel was angry and he cried out to the Lord all that night. Here, so there, Saul is commanded to go and destroy, completely eradicate the Amalekites. And he does kind of, but a partial obedience is still disobedience. And so the people, the soldiers, they see these good things and they say, but these we should keep, right? Why would it, it would be wasteful to destroy these things. Um, but they are disobeying God's command to completely eradicate the Amalekites. Now, yes, this is harsh. And this is like hard to like say like, oh, wow, this is a, uh, this is what God wanted his people to do. Um, but the Amalekites, were harassing the people of Israel when they're coming out of Egypt and trying to come into the land. They have been a problem and they will continue to be a problem throughout the rest of Saul's life. And eventually David will be the one to finally um, defeat the Amalekites. But the they disobeyed the Lord here. And the, here we see God saying, I regret that I made Saul king. And this regret, this tone of regret, like echoes back to uh, Genesis uh, when the Lord regretted making humanity humanity because everything in their heart was wicked all of the time and that led to the flood and his um destruction of humanity uh but rescuing a remnant in noah's family and so that is the same kind of heaviness here that the lord has there there seems to be no uh redeeming saul and so, uh, so early in the morning, Samuel got up and went to meet Saul, but he was told Saul has gone to Carmel there. He has set up a monument in his own honor and has turned and gone down on down to Gilgal. So Saul sets up a monument for himself at Carmel, uh, which is troubling, um, that he, this is not a good thing for him to do. When Samuel reached him, Saul said, the Lord bless you. I have carried out the Lord's instructions. But Samuel said, what then is the bleeding of sheep in my ears? What is this lowing of cattle that I hear? Saul answered, the soldiers brought them from the Amalekites and spared the best of the sheep and cattle to sacrifice to the Lord, your God. But we totally destroyed the rest. Enough, Samuel said to Saul, let me tell you what the Lord said to me last night. So he's saying like, look, we are going to offer these as a sacrifice to God. You should not be mad. I'm doing a holy thing, uh, but Samuel's not messing around. Um, and so let me tell you what the Lord told me. Tell me, Saul replied. Samuel said, although you were once small in your own eyes, did you not become the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel. And he sent you on a mission saying, go to completely destroy these wicked people, the Amalekites, wage war against them until you have wiped them out. Why did you not obey the Lord? Why did you pounce on the plunder and do evil in the eyes of the Lord? But I did obey the Lord, Saul said. I went to the, on the mission the Lord assigned me. 
I completely destroyed the Amalekites and brought back Agag, their king. The soldiers took sheep and cattle from the plunder, the best of what was devoted to the Lord, in order to sacrifice them to the Lord your God at Gilgal. But Samuel replied, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, as much as in obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination and arrogance, like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. Dang, Samuel. I, this is like, this is intense. Samuel saying these things is taking his own life in his hands. Because the king, the most powerful person uh, in the country, like he's confronting him saying, you have done the wrong thing. What you think is doing God a favor is disobedience. God doesn't care about these sheep that he wanted to be destroyed to be offered as sacrifices because they're unclean. They're unworthy. They should not be offered as sacrifices. So they are a problem. But then he goes on. He says, to obey is better than sacrifice. So just do what God tells you to do. That's better than these sacrifices that you think will make God happy. Uh, And he compares rebellion to divination and arrogance to idolatry. And this rebellion and uh, idea of of trying to say like, well, I'm going to make these offerings to try to earn God's favor. Because divination is essentially trying to manipulate spiritual forces for your benefit. And so this offering that, that, uh, Saul is is putting before the Lord is nothing more than just trying to manipulate God. And so it's it's wrong. You cannot manipulate God is what Samuel is telling Saul. Um, and, and later on in his life, we're going to see that Saul resorts to divination as he's at, towards the end of his life, as he's trying to figure out like, how can I win? How can I defeat my enemies? Um, but uh, yeah, divination and trying to get God to do things for him is something that, that Saul will struggle with um, for the rest, rest of his ministry, his life. Um, and so verse 24, Saul then said to Samuel, I have sinned. I violated the Lord's command and your instructions. I was afraid of the men. And so I gave in to them. That theme again of being afraid of the men, like he saw the men taking these good sheep and cattle and wanting to preserve them for themselves. And he, he's like, I don't really want to offend my best soldiers. And so he let it happen. Um, And so I, cause he was afraid, but Samuel said to him, "Uh, now I beg you for this is Saul. I beg you forgive my sin and come back with me so that I may worship the Lord. But Samuel said to him, I will not go back with you. You have rejected the word of the Lord. The Lord has rejected you as king over Israel. As Samuel turned to leave, Saul caught hold of the hem of his robe and it tore. Samuel said to him, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to one of your neighbors, to one better than you. He who is the glory of Israel does not lie or change his mind, for he is not a human being that he should change his mind. Saul replied, I have sinned, but please honor me before the elders of my people and before Israel come back with me so that I may worship the Lord your God. So Samuel went back with Saul, and Saul worshiped the Lord. Then Samuel said, bring me Agag, king of the Amalekites. And Agag came to him in chains, and he thought, surely the bitterness of death is past. Now, one of the translations here in verse A, uh, and if you have like a, if your Bible maybe has a, a footnote, and you follow that 32A down to the bottom of the page, the meaning of the Hebrew word for this phrase is uncertain. So, um, because it is interesting, bring me Agag the Malachite. Agag came in chains and he thought, surely the bitterness of death is past. Um, and so there is a, a, another way that people are p- potentially translating this to say, he came kind of cocky and arrogant and saying like, I'm good. I'm totally fine. Saul's going to like one king to another. He's going to spare my life. Um, but Samuel said, as your sword has made women childless, so will your mother be childless among women. And Samuel put Agag to death before the Lord at Gilgal. Then Samuel left for Ramah, but Saul went up to his home in Gibeah of Saul. Until the day Samuel died, he did not go to see Saul again. 
though Samuel mourned for him, and the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. So this is the last interaction with, with, between Saul and Samuel while, Saul, while Samuel is alive. Because there is going to be a later interaction, the ghost of Samuel. And it's a weird story. And we'll get to it when we get to it. But uh, yeah, so this is Samuel coming and saying, like, you have disobeyed the Lord. You have done wrong. And so like everything you've done, Saul, is, is, comes down to his fear of people, his fear of people. And when if we remember back to when he was first called, he was afraid of the people then. Like Sam, Saul it doesn't seem like he ever really wanted to be king, um, but he was put into this place. Um, and his fear of the people is something that hamstrung his ministry, his leadership. Um, and so Saul and Samuel separate and they never see each other again in Samuel's lifetime. And so that's where we're going to end tonight. Um, and next week we will meet David. And uh, it will be a, uh, a good transition um, for, uh, for the story um, as we will again see more conflict, though, between David and Saul pretty quickly. So, yeah, any questions on uh, 1 Samuel chapters 12 through 15? No. I have a question. Yes. Um, Jonathan never heard the vow that Samuel makes. Did that, he? The vow that I Saul mean, made. To Saul, I mean, not Samuel, Saul. That right. Saul made the oath. So Saul thought he should die, but in the eyes of the Lord, he never heard it. So am I splitting hairs here? What? Because um, he is under Saul, right? Yeah. Yeah, so he is under Saul. This is a great point that you're making because uh, the oath is the oath. Yeah. Saul, if he is making an oath to the Lord, need, needs to carry out his oath, right? Otherwise, Saul is disobedient. So whether or not Jonathan heard it is irrelevant. Um, and so Saul, uh, his oath is rash. It is not a good idea which is part of the problem. And if we go back to the book of Judges, there's a, uh, as Japheth makes an oath to say, whatever comes out of my house after this victory, I'm going to devote to the Lord. And what, who comes out? His daughter. And so he, uh, he executes his daughter as a part of an oath. Now, no, God never told Japheth to make that oath. It was his own like arrogance. And, um, and so that's part of the problem. And so John Saul makes this oath. It's not about God at all. It's about, it's about Saul. No one should eat until I'm avenged of my enemies. And so it's about it's Saul's arrogance again and his, his, his pettiness here. He's making an oath and he's put, enforcing it on all the other people. It's a bad idea all the way around. Um, and so uh, the people, uh, the people intervene and they say like, you know, no, this was a bad thing that you did, Saul. This was bad. You should not do this. Um, it's really so, bad yeah. for a leader. That's yeah. really when the people are saying, no, you made a mistake. Right. He could have just turned around and said, you're right, I made a mistake, but he would never do that. I mean, right. he's that arrogant. Yeah. And making the oath, like, you know, now he's, he's supposed to do it. <laughs> like, that's the problem. Oath is an oath. It's an oath. An oath is an oath. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why um, Jesus tells us in the gospels, let your yes be yes and your no be no, right? Like don't swear on all the different gold in the temple or the hairs on your head, like all of these things, like oaths are costly, right? They, like, if you are going to make an oath, it's a serious thing. And so are you thinking about it? Are you considering the cost before you make the oath? And Saul, Saul didn't do that. He just was like, avenge me of my enemies. And uh, yeah, so Jonathan, who made the whole victory like happen because of his actions, uh, you know, the people are like, you shouldn't punish Jonathan for sparing the people. Well, Saul didn't do it. Jonathan did. And right. here he is, yeah. avenge me. 
uh, yeah, it, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, as we read Saul, we're going to see he is a very insecure and petty person. So, yeah, I mean, but, you know, God's saying, like, you're not going to be king forever. That will also, like, hurt your 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 uh, morale as a leader. <laughs> like, it's like, well, what am I supposed to do? So, yeah. Maybe that's why he went on his own. You know, you never know. Yeah. That, that ego pride thing. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Tony, I see a raised hand. Hey, Jason. Hey, man. Hey, uh, what does it really mean? Uh, the scripture says, God regretted making Saul king. Yeah. Is, is it just something that Samuel said? Or, or I mean, can God really regret? Right. Yeah. Can yeah. God really regret? Because he knew, uh, he, 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 I mean, he knows all things. Mm -hmm. see all things what does that really mean to for god to regret making saul king yeah okay that's a really good question and i have uh a section that i highlighted from a, a commentary that i wanted to i, I, I want to read um so one of the ways that we can read regret is grieved that's an important thing a translation decision so regret it regret or grief those are translation decisions that uh the the translation committees make and either one could work and so they have to kind of decide like what's the best way to go um and so when uh this commentator says and this is uh robert bergen in the new american commentary series uh he says uh god first of all god was grieved in quotes grieved that he made saul king the only other occasion in scripture where the lord stated that he was grieved uh over people's actions was when he observed the wickedness of humanity that led to the universal flood in Genesis chapter six. Second, the Lord revealed that the source of his grief was Saul's failure to follow his instructions completely. Saul's partial obedience might have been acceptable to his contemporaries, but when weighed in the divine balances, it was found wanting. Nothing short of strict obedience to the Lord's instructions was acceptable. Anything less produced grief in heaven and pain and loss on earth. Um, and so another commentator says, God does not just decide things ahead of time and implement, implement them regardless of what happens. How God relates to us interacts with our decisions and our lives. Saul's unwillingness to do what God said about Amalek is just as bad as if he had been involved in divination by means of effigies, like burning different things. Um, and that's John Golden Gay, uh, in that second quote. And so the the regret is a decision uh translation decision but grieved is a uh is a more i think more accurate application and uh of the word because god sees that saul's disobedience and he's um like yes the lord chose saul but he also sees like saul's disobedience is like breaking his heart for what could have been like and and Samuel said that earlier, the Lord would have given you a dynasty that would have lasted forever. But because you are disobeying him, because you you first try to rush in and, and do this all the sacrifice on your own that you're not supposed to do, like God's going to not let your name, your kingdom last forever. And now here, as he's not doing the thing to, do, uh, you know, he wants vengeance against his enemies, but only if it works on his boundaries, like he he's not he's not doing what god said and that's what grieves him what grieves the lord is the disobedience so does that make sense tony uh yeah 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 so like um i think I, one of the things that is challenging is like we have this um this view of the lord like that you know if we we believe that god orchestrates and directs actions right and so a word like regret is something where it's like god made a mistake and um it's not that god made a mistake in choosing saul but he is grieved that saul's mistakes are creating greater pain for the people um and so he, he grieves their his his rebellion the same way he grieves the re the rebellion of the people uh, of humanity in Genesis six. 
but yeah, so that's the best okay. description. The be- that's the best uh, re- explanation in the, the commentaries that, that I uh, came across was the, com- the contrast between the words, the choices, grieved and regret. Um, yeah. Any other questions? All right. Well, cool, cool, cool. Um, one of the things I, I should have mentioned this, there's a conflict that happens between in the conflict between Saul and Samuel, Saul keeps saying, uh, the Lord, your God, and that, that's it, something that we should note. Like he's distancing himself from Yahweh and saying the Lord, your God. Um, it should be the Lord, our God. But he, so Saul sees Samuel as a representative of the Lord. Um, and, you know, it's one of those things where it's like, well, did Saul ever really have any kind of relationship with God? Did he really know God? And as we walk through his life, we see that he doesn't, seem to have a knowing of God in his life. Um, He knows about God. He knows godly things, but his disobedience is something that reveals a lack of knowing God. D, I see a raised hand. I have a quick commentary. So- Yes, sir. Ma'am, sorry. uh, That's okay. I (laughs) usually refer to Taylor- as Tony's daughter, say your daughter just did such and such <laughs> when she disobeys. No joke, and she just did something while we were listening to about listening about Samuel and Saul, and she just did something today. And I said, your daughter is downstairs doing such and such. So it was just funny while I was listening to it. I was laughing because he kept saying your God. <laughs> <laughs> that's that is like, funny this is in himself and I'm like your daughter just did this downstairs. <laughs> Yeah, that is, uh, yeah, that's funny. I, and I think every parent has done that exact thing. Like your kid is doing this. It's like, yeah, when the kid is doing good things, it's my kid. When the kid is doing rebellious things, that's Kathy's child. <laughs> so, um, and vice versa. So we, we both fall into that. So, yeah. All right, y'all. Um, well, uh, Next week, David. We're gonna read David and Goliath, and it's gonna be super fun. And this sixteen, maybe year old kid cuts off a giant's head and carries this sword around and carries his header. It's gonna be so cool. So <laughs> I'm excited. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jason. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, y'all have a good night, and I will see you Sunday. Uh, remember, ten o'clock service um, and prayer school at nine. If you're able to make it for a prayer school. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's going to be a great, great week. I sh- I will be back Lord willing and the creeks don't rise. I'll be back with you. I'm healthy. I'm good. I'm, I'm ready to be reunited with Creekside in person. Okay. So, all right. Talk to y'all good later. Have you back. All right. Bye. Have a good night. Bye.